chapter 2, verses 19 to 21. Jesus has just driven the merchants and the money changers from the temple, and the Jews ask for a sign that shows his right to have done so. Listen now for God's word for you. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. This is God's word for you. Thanks be to God. If you're wondering which temple that is, hear now our second scripture reading from the book of 1 Kings, starting with um, chapter 5. Now King Hiram of Tyre sent his servants to Solomon when he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David. Solomon sent word to Hiram, saying, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord his God because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him, until the Lord put, him, put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on the throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, this, by the way, is after the temple's been built, and assembled all the heads of all the tribes and the leaders of all the ancestral houses of the Israelites before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month, and all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant out of the house of the Lord to its place, to the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread their wings out over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim made a covering above the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that they were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand and minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Nearly 70 years ago, when Don Allen was called by our predecessor Presbytery to organize the church that would eventually become Trinity, an old dilapidated house sat on the edge of this growing neighborhood. The house itself already had quite a history, a history that we are going to be learning and hearing more about in the coming months. And the plan at that point was to tear down the house and build a church. The group of pilgrims began meeting here they were literally brushing aside broken glass in order to set up folding chairs each week. They recognized that the church was not a building, but it was the people. 
and that it didn't make sense to begin as a new expression of the local church with a huge building project and a big mortgage. So instead, they got to work themselves. They fixed up this old house, they repurposed the rooms, and they created a place where the church, that is the people, could gather each week. From the very beginning, Trinity was never confined to the building itself. So many churches these days are saddled by building needs. They either have very old and grand buildings that are in desperate need of costly repair, or they have beautiful new buildings and the lingering debt of construction. Many churches are deciding these days to sell their property, to downsize, or to become mobile, renting out space that they once had used and is now using, uh, being used for other services. Arlington Presbyterian Church in Arlington, Virginia, discerned over the course of a decade a new calling to sell their church and their land and to make a way for affordable housing development in its place. That's pretty cool. There are other churches, however, that are just closing their doors. They are increasingly more restaurants and bars and high-end apartments that are now housed in converted old churches that would have otherwise closed. The church is not the building, but it also turns out that having a building can be pretty useful. Where else are you gonna store your seasonal materials? Where will you have meetings? And if you rent space, everything needs to be set up and then torn down and stored somewhere. And Kate's nodding because she has been at a church very much like this in Denver, the House for All Sinners and Saints. And who's gonna do all that work? Church buildings also, beyond their utilitarian purpose, can invite us into a particular kind of space. Many churches are built and equipped for beauty, which taps into our spirit in different ways. From soaring cathedrals to, well, our more humble but no less beautiful abode, stepping into a space can engender an immediate sense that God is here. Soon after the Israelites left Egypt, God gave extensive instructions for how they should build the tabernacle, the tent of meeting. It was movable, but it was still beautiful and still filled with the presence of God. But as Israel became a settled kingdom, King David started to think that if he had a nice palace, then maybe God should too. Of course, he was kept from building that project. I guess it depends on who you ask about the reasons why, but eventually that fell to his son Solomon. As I mentioned, we skipped the chapters that describe the ornate and costly beauty that was involved in this building project, but suffice it to say, it was grand. Of course, it doesn't still stand to this day. Some scriptures don't hold up over time in that way. But imagine the excitement that would have surrounded this temple dedication. It would have engendered deep pride among the people in this accomplishment as well as a sense of awe of God's presence. But most importantly, they sensed God's presence so strongly that the priests were swept off their feet, unable even to stand. God was with the people in the temple, but God had also been with the people in the tabernacle and in the wilderness without any kind of building because God's presence has never been confined to a building. Trinity's founding community knew this, of course, and as in the early church, the body of Christ was also nurtured in homes through house churches. And over the years, this old house has undergone many transitions and renovations, including the addition of this sanctuary in the 1980s, and then the building of the commons and kitchen and other rooms in the first decade of the century. We've opened the building and grounds to the community, and the community use has been one of our primary missions over the years. And here we are, 
with a laundry list of repairs and replacements and additions on the list, as well as the upkeep and improvements to our newly installed technology. With so many needs in our community and beyond, one can rightly ask whether the brickwork is really all that important, or how we can justify tens of thousands of dollars on technology that we use on Sunday mornings. The church is not the building, and the church is not the live stream, but these are ways and places that we connect together and with a new and growing community that extends far beyond these walls. When COVID hit, the building may have closed, but as we know, the church did not. We continued to gather week after week in worship, in nurture, in mission, and in fellowship. And the technology that has enabled to us to do all of this, in some ways, is a church building itself. It's a place where the body of Christ can gather. And just as the bricks need to be maintained, so does the infrastructure that connects us virtually. What's become clear to all of us, not just here at church, but wherever you find yourself these days, is that there is no return to what was. And there is grief in that loss. But we also see that God is doing a new thing. We are still discerning God's leading and still figuring out how to be faithful in changing times and circumstances. We are the church reformed, always being reformed according to the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And today is Reformation Sunday. Today is the 504th anniversary of the day on which Martin Luther was said to have nailed his 95 theses onto the church door the late church historian Phyllis Tickle has noticed and documented a pattern of every 500 years. There's a major upheaval, a major change in not just the Christian church, but in all major world religions. A shift that forever changes the religious landscape. The last one for Christians was the Reformation, so we're now a few years overdue. In fact, the religious landscape here and elsewhere has been shifting and changing over the last number of decades. I think many of us have seen it and we've felt it, but many churches have remained slow and unwilling to change. In some ways, COVID has forced our hand. It's forced us to adapt and change the way that we understand what it means to be church and how to do faithful ministry in this day and age. And if we simply try to go back to what was, it will be to find shelter in what was old and familiar, rather than discerning and following the new thing that God is doing. And speaking of new things, have you been to the church recently? <laughs> You've heard that saying, when it rains it pours. Well. We were just hitting our stride with online services. We had just celebrated our first virtual Easter, and then the rains came. There was some roofing work that was being done on the church at that time, and it wasn't quite secured properly against the weather, so when the storms blew in that night, the rain literally came pouring in. Coming in on Easter Monday, I heard the peaceful sounds of running water it was like an indoor water feature in a nice, relaxing spa. The scene, however, was quite different. Water had come through the roof and was pouring through the second floor and ceiling and downing the ceiling tiles. The carpet was soaked. The drywall was destroyed. It was a mess. And as is often the case before rebuilding, we had to strip down to the studs. We used this opportunity to get rid of a bathroom that had been anything but hospitable and to make room, <laughs> there's a lot of nodding, <laughs> to make room for the finance team to have the space that they had needed for so long. Last week, Mark asked us, what is in our luggage? Well, the past 19 months have gifted us with the opportunity to strip down to the studs and discern the most faithful way to move forward. 
For many reasons, this couldn't have happened at a better time. We've been able to get a lot done without worrying about all of the activity that was here pre-COVID. In fact, back then, even finding 24 hours just to do some flooring work was nearly impossible. The last number of months have been very busy, even in the midst of a closed building. So today we gather to celebrate the new and dedicate it. When the drywall was removed, this beautiful brick was uncovered the original external brick of the house. And we decided to open it up and preserve it as a connection to what has been and as a reminder of the complicated history of this place. It's both an invitation to give thanks and to repent. Our office spaces have been rejuvenated. Our hallways feel much brighter and more welcoming. And then funny story, just after the last repair things had been done in the rest of the rebuilding construction, the beautiful old parquet flooring in the sanctuary began to buckle again. We took that opportunity to extend the same flooring into the sanctuary. Upstairs, we were able to retain much of the original mural that was painted by Derek Brownsword along with our youth group at the time while also lightening up that space quite a bit. And the reconstruction work wasn't the only new thing happening. In January, we very gratefully welcomed our parish associate for pastoral care, Gwen Carr. And once she began to be able to come to Harrisonburg more often, she needed her own office space. Jim Newman transformed what had been the former keyboard kingdom, what had been the former Euchre office, what had been the former Don Allen office, and other things, and it is now a beautiful space to support Gwen's ministry with us. Jim and Jenny Newman have been very busy over the past year. They repaired and repainted the walls and the two classrooms adjacent to that office, preparing the space to be repurposed for the new centering space at Trinity. Now, I hope you saw those rooms before. We should have gotten more before pictures. But if you did, you'll know the huge transformation that took place and that that wouldn't have been possible at all without the amazing and whole building cleanup and purge led by Francis Sale a year ago. The one worship service that we canceled on March 15th of 2020 was to have been led by the Centering Space team and we were going to launch the work to create a new space for contemplation, action, renewal, and expression here at Trinity. While we embraced that opportunity to shift online, the work at the church house continued. And we are now almost ready to welcome the community to use that renovated and peaceful space, which is a true harbor. These rooms will be available for day retreats, for the practice of spiritual disciplines and other mind and body centering practices and other uses. So we move from that serene space to this one, the closet that was repurposed as a tech room, the result of significant investment in our hybrid capabilities and countless, 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 countless hours from our tech team. Joe Hinshaw planned and installed it all with a lot of help from Yogi and Mark and others. And Deanne and Joe have been working to train more volunteers in each of the different roles so you too could have a seat in the room where it happens. If seeing that stresses you out, don't worry. You can take some time to enjoy the meditation walk around our church grounds. You can follow the paper guides or use the church website to navigate through the different stations, which include spaces that have been with us for a while, like the Memorial Garden and the Labyrinth, as well as new developments during this time of COVID. The Environmental Bequest Task Force, which was pulled together to steward generous gifts from Mary Louise Fisher and Nancy Caperton, and gifts given in memory of other saints of the church, including Betty Allen and Chalice McMillan and Chad and Charles Churchman. 
have been planning and pruning and planting and exercising better stewardship on our behalf in our part of creation. An ash tree had to come down, and from its remains, we now have a peaceful bench handcrafted by J.B. Paez and Malcolm Cameron. And in the background, you can see some of the newly planted trees in our, our yard. We also have the pollinator garden, which is doing its work in the back of the property, providing hospitality for the winged creatures that nurture and propagate life, and these picnic benches, made a few years ago by Bethany Hinshaw and Mark Facknitz, which have been providing hospitality to our neighbors, great and small. Mark has expressed far more eloquently the stunning generosity of this congregation when there had been need for building repairs, and when we needed to continue making serious investments in our worship live stream, both in terms of personnel and equipment, you all stepped up. And you all also have answered the call generously to give from your stimulus money to support our immigrant neighbors when COVID hit. And without hesitation, the session voted to give $10,000 to start to support the work at Massanetta Springs to support incoming refugees and those seeking safety from war-torn countries. And then you all continued to give thousands more from individual contributions to the same cause. You all have cared for each other. You've given your time and money and to resources to support neighbors in precarious circumstances, to provide shelter for houseless individuals, to feed children and their families, and to provide clothing in abundance. This building is not the church. All of that is the church. God doesn't need a fancy house or any house. God's presence can be with us here in the sanctuary, and God's presence is surely with those who have no sanctuary. The church is not the building but the building and the technology that has ex have extended our walls beyond Harrisonburg give us space to gather in person, online at 10 a.m. or any time after that. And gathered in worship, we hear God's word and we listen for God's invitation to us in this day and place. As a church and as people, we are continually being reformed reformed according to the word of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit, and we are still a work in progress. For all that has been, we give thanks. For all that will be, we give thanks. In this season of stewardship and at all times, thanks be to God. Before we sing our song of response, which I think you'll see was an obvious choice, I invite us to join prayerfully as we dedicate the new spaces here at Trinity. Let us pray. Throughout all of history, God's people have been gathered in worship and sent out for mission in the desert, the temple, in exile, in synagogues, in house churches, in catacombs, in medieval cathedrals, in village chapels, in factory towns, on the frontier, in immigrant parishes, in the suburbs, during times of persecution, and during times of social dominance for the church, during peace, during war, during depressions, during economic expansion. Today we gather in this building and online, in places of transition or relative stability, having received gifts and having been challenged in a global pandemic. We give thanks for the work and ministry of this particular church, and while we recognize that the church is not the building, we give thanks for this sacred space where we can gather. We recognize that we gather on land that was part of ancestral hunting grounds and travel routes of various groups of indigenous peoples. We acknowledge with gratitude these stewards of the land through the ages. We grapple with more recent history of this land and property, knowing that enslaved people lived and toiled here, 
with unpaid labor on the land and in the house, enriching those who built and owned this home and property. We repent of our continued complicity in systems of white supremacy and the ways in which we continue to benefit today. We give thanks for this church house and grounds and for the communion of saints gathered as Trinity Presbyterian Church who have worked to rebuild and reshape this place for worship, mission, nurture, and fellowship. We give thanks for those who have died, whose legacies continue to bear fruit in ministry. May these halls serve as connections within this body and community for worship, mission, nurture, and fellowship. May the work done in these offices be guided by the Holy Spirit. May we seek always to serve with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love in all of our operations. We thank you for the gift of sacred space. We pray that you will continue to shape us to be as wildly inclusive and welcoming as you are. And we pray for a way forward to increase our gathering safely for all who seek to gather here. We thank you for the many gifts that have been enabled our ministry to continue and expand through online worship and more. We pray for the growing virtual and hybrid community, that we would continue to grow and even as we continue to worship together, but apart. Bless those who have given their time and talents, a few hours or a few thousand. May their spirits be renewed and may they find joy in the mission. We thank you for Gwen Carr and the many ways in which she ministers, here and in other underserved areas, including Craigsville and Buffalo Gap. We thank you for the gifts she brings and the love and care that she shares. May her office be a place where sacred time is kept and where her spirit can be refreshed. May all who visit it experience your presence. We pray for the centering space giving thanks for financial grants that have paved the way for the new thing to be birthed. May these spaces provide a harbor, a retreat for weary souls, a place for contemplation, action, renewal, and expression. We give thanks for seed money that has become seed money, for the faithful witness and care for creation that we continue to steward in new ways. May we move forward in these and other projects in ways that heal our corner of creation and that invite the community into the sacred outdoor space. We thank you that you are still at work in and through us. In a season that has brought so much loss and change, we are grateful for the gifts that we have received even in the midst of these difficulties. Continue to reform us according to your word and the power of the Holy Spirit. All of this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite us to stand and sing our song of response. We are the church.